11, Revelation chapter 11, we're coming now to the midpoint of the tribulation. And it's kind of interesting, we're right in the middle of the book of Revelation. So we see in verse, verse 1 of chapter 11, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my witnesses, and they will prophesy one hundred, or excuse me, one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls on the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented their, those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from the Lord entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God, the God of heaven. The second woe was past. Behold, the third woe was coming. Then the seventh trumpet sounded, and there, was a loud, there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before, the, before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to uh, you, O, um, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were hungry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and noises and thunderings on earth, an earthquake and a great hail. Now that's a quite an interesting passage of scripture that we're looking at today. And of course, uh, we're seeing then that, um, that these prophets, when did they come? Well, we would think this was the first part of the tribulation. And so with all the rest of the things that are going on, we realize that uh, God is preaching the word even from Jerusalem. And uh, then the, he's giving, and again, when God is changing things, he gives certain powers to people to, for verification that he's working. I don't have those powers today because, uh, 
you know, God is not working miracles today. He is working through the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying we don't have miracles, but I'm saying I am not the person that God has said, okay, he's the one. And we see that with Moses. He had special powers. We see that with Peter for the first part of his ministry. We see that with Paul with the first part of his ministry, that uh, they had specific powers. We saw that uh, with God was warning Israel of judgment with Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Elijah, Elijah had seven miracles that he did. And uh, then we see that Elisha had 14. And so, uh, and he prayed for, you know, that he would have double portion and he got it. And so we see that, uh, that God uses special people at special times for f special projects. And so uh, uh, I'm not a faith healer, but I do go to the hospital and I, I sat with a man for an hour and a half this past week, prayed with him over his soul and over his body. Now, I want to see God heal him, but if he doesn't, I mean, if he does, I don't want to be the one to say, oh my, you got to have this preacher come and pray for you. That's not, I mean, I want, I mean, I want to have the idea that, yeah, I want this, per this pastor to pray for me because, you know, he knows the Lord, but it's not because I'm a faith healer. Does that make sense? You know, the prayer of faith shall heal the sick, but uh, I'm not a faith healer and God has not called me. That's one reason I've said I don't want to be a person known for casting out demons. Demons scare me. You know, I, I don't want to be the one that uh, if I, I think I have worked at times and where I've seen God work in people's hearts and I think, you know, the devil has left them. But uh, I don't want to be the person who meets that demon one on one uh, as far as I know. I mean, you know, those are things that God gives specific whenever he's changing things or whenever he's about ready to do something. He gives special powers to special people. And here we see that that's what he has done here in the book of Revelation. We have two prophets. And we see that uh, this is now going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, and Jacob, of course, is Israel. So this is what we're saying. The first three and a half years, God's judging the Gentiles, but he is also bringing the Jews back to himself. And then we see in the last part of the tribulation, is centered so much around the Jews and what the Gentiles are going to be trying to do to the Jews and around Jerusalem. And these are all things that, uh, that's why we say that prophecy is so Jewish-centered. If you don't, the more you know about Old Testament prophecy, the more that uh, New Testament prophecy comes alive. Because you got to realize that most of this, especially from uh, chapter 12 on, is going to be centered around what the Gentiles are going to be doing to the Jew. And at the same time, God is going to be judging the Gentiles and bringing the Jews back to himself. And so we see now, then he says in verse one, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and an angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple. This is almost like the same vision that God gave to Jeremiah in chapter 30. And he told him to measure that, measure the temple. And so, um, and and then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about the temple and measuring uh, the temple. Now, we know that uh, the, uh, the Israelites or the Jews in Jerusalem now, I, I was listening to some newscast this past week on uh, the Christian radio station, and they were talking about they are looking all kinds of places for different artifacts or whatever the temple, and they are gathering a lot of material to build that, uh, that uh, tribulation temple. Uh, you got to distinguish between the tribulation temple and what God's going to do when he comes back and rebuilds the temple in the millennium. But uh, we see now that uh, they are, are they're good. then of course there's all kinds of arguments about exactly where that temple is going to be. And uh, there's a big mosque there now, the Dome of the Rock or whatever they call it. And, uh, you know, that's going to have to either move, be moved out of the way or they're going to discover, and this is what many people believe, is that they're discovering the temple is a little bit off site from that. So I don't know which way it's going to go, uh, but God is, you know, if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it's not going to start World War III. And so all this stuff that's going on and people say you can't do these things, well, God will do whatever he wants to do and God will do whatever he plans. And so we see that um, he was given a reed and measuring rod and an angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple, the altar, and the worship there. But now notice he says, but, but leave out those outer courts. Leave out those outer things, 
of, for, well, for one thing, we know the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God was going to be. And we see that uh, that actual Holy of Holies, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's many people that believe that, that, uh, that uh, you, the Ark, if it's here on earth, a lot of people believe it's down in Egypt, but then there's other people believe that no, it's really in heaven. I don't know that this, this uh, gives an insinuation that at least the presence of God for that ark is in heaven. And so we see that, uh, that <clears throat> there are, um, that he, he, goes, he says that, but leave out the court and the outside temple and do not measure it for this is given to the Gentiles that they should tread upon the holy city underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. And we don't have time in this uh, study as we're just surveying Revelation, but this is really ties right into uh, Daniel. And he talks about the time, time and half times, which was three and a half years, and talks about, uh, <clears throat> about what's going to happen there. Um, and he, gives, uh, he really goes into it, and we'll get into the book of Daniel and then try to tie them to, together. But we see that uh, he says that... Um, that and they shall tread on the city 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy uh, 1,260 days. That's three and a half years, uh, clothed in sackcloth. And so we see that these preachers have a worldwide ministry. There again, until about 50 years ago with a tele, uh, uh, tele uh the satellite uh, communication, uh, we didn't know exactly how you could do that and broadcast all over the world. And now we, we do know that one person can stand right here in Belvedere and talk to people in Australia. And we've even got phones that do that. You know, I, um, when my son was in South Korea, we talked to him and they would go on the phone, you know, so you can actually uh, communicate with people all the way around the world. And so these men... Uh, are going to be preaching the gospel. Remember what we said, God will never leave himself without a witness. He always gives a man a choice. He gave Adam a choice. He, in the millennium, he will be giving the people who are born without the curse of sin the opportunity to sin. Do you want to follow me or not? And we'll see that some will say no. And they will turn away from God. Isn't that sad? He gave the angels a choice. And so uh, any created being that... Uh, uh, that uh, as a soul or has, um, except for animals and so forth, but uh, the souls of men and angels. Uh, right? We see that God deals with them and gives them a choice whether to follow him or not. And so we see that uh, he says that, but they leave out the court, um, he's given to the Gentiles and they shall tread it. Uh, and he gave power to the two witnesses to prophesy. Now, in verse four, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God, the God of the earth. So we see that uh, in the, the verses one and two, John told the uh, measure of the temple, which includes the holy place and would include the altar of incense and the holy of holies. The act of measuring signifies knowing and claiming and staking it out. Now, there's a piece of land that I'm praying about to, well, I better be careful with this because it's just a pipe dream. And whenever you mention, oh, the pastor's plant, no, I'm always looking for things. But, you know, uh, I've always got dreams of what God can do here. Uh, but uh, someone has a prime piece of land, and uh, I was looking at that land, and uh, it's not mine. So, and, there's, and I could think about dreaming about building a building there, but it's not mine. But if I get out there and start measuring things out, all of a sudden people say, He's got some specific plans. Oh, man, okay, I'm going to drive a stake here, and I got my ruler, and I'm going to, boy, if I start doing that, then I'm starting to say, I'm really, I got serious plans here. And so this is what God is saying here, that uh, I want you to stake it out. I want you to, uh, to, to work with these things. He said, but leave out the, the outside. And, give, and he said, uh, and they shall tread that underfoot. And, I, and so we see that um, he says um, the worshipers are the Jews. The Gentiles in the Old Testament are restricted to the outer courts. Remember, uh, we even see that in the book of Acts. 
where the Jews were inside the synagogue, but the good Gentiles that wanted to worship God were on the outside. We saw that with Cornelius, and we see that especially now with the Gentiles that uh, Paul goes into um, Philippi, and there's no, uh, while he was able to talk to the um, to everybody there because there was no synagogue there, but you'll see that, uh, you saw that in all of his first missionary journeys, and now we'll see it in Thessalonica and Berea. And he went to the synagogues first, but there were always those Gentiles outside, and more Gentiles were saved than, than Jews. And so we see that to the, but the worshipers of the Jews and the Gentiles had the out, outer courts. Uh, uh, and uh, he says the worship will occur during the first half of the tribulation. Now, remember what happened? The Jews were worshiping, but there were 144,000 Jews that were calling other Jews back to the Lord during this time. And so this is now the Jews are coming back in earnest from all over the world, or at least um, looking at it on their phones from all over the world and wanting to worship God there at the temple. And of course, they're going to be preaching Christ. And the temple will be tread underfoot for three and a half years by the Gentiles, led by the man of sin. Now, and of course, that's a Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, this man shall be revealed, and he's going to be specifically coming after the Jews. Now, in verse 3 through 14, we see that great um, interesting story about um, these two witnesses. Who are they? He says, and I will give power to two witnesses, and they shall prophesy th uh, for three and a half years, uh, they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. That was always a picture of mourning or a picture of, uh, of judgment. I mean, they, they're not dressed up and saying, hey, listen, I got good news. They're saying, you know, judgment's coming. And so we see now that uh, he says they, there are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God. And so these witnesses um, have um, the... Uh, um, are going to uh, worship the, for three and a half years. We say that's a, the Jewish calendar, 360 days would be this three and a half years. Now, the olive tree was a symbol of Israel. And the lampstand, of course, was, of course, we saw the Lord walking among the lampstands in the church, but, it was always, but the lampstands also were a picture of God's presence. There were two lampstands uh, in the uh, in the temple, or in the actually the inner courts of the temple, and one was over the showbread, and one was uh, uh, going into the holy of holies, and that that was the light. That was those were the lights that lit up uh, the inner court. So that was remember the outside was open and really wasn't very pretty, but once you got inside those inner courts, it turned majestic and beautiful. And so you had, and, but there were no windows, so the window, the light were those lampstands. And so this was a picture, the olive tree and the lampstands was a picture now of God uh, dealing with the Israel. And of course, he's the light of the world. And the lampstands, even though we see that they represented the churches, it really is, uh, without the light, there's no lampstand. I mean, you might as well throw away the lampstands, there's no light. But we're to keep the oil burning, are we not? We're to keep the, the lampstand burning. And so um, he says, and um, he said, uh, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and de de devours their enemies. Now, again, does anybody know of anybody who has those type powers? This is a specific power at a specific time in a specific, well, with a, a specific mission. So were these men, are they going to be unique? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, they are going to get all the CNNs and MSNBCs and everybody else over there saying these people are weird. And of course, they're going to always turn it against them uh, and make them sound like they're dragons or the devil or whatever when actually they're emissaries of God. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the Gentiles as well as the Jews react to that. Um, and so um, he says... If anybody wants to harm them, that, that's one thing. 
Uh, even, and you can imagine, there'd be all kinds of people trying to shoot them, uh, blow them up, uh, poison them. And yet God has a special hand upon them that they can't be hurt. And they have power uh, to shut heaven so they could actually stop the rain. Now, would they do it all over the earth or they could actually stop it in certain parts? Now, we know that with all the rest of the things going on, uh, that this would have to be localized, uh, but he, they could actually pronounce a um, judgment upon a certain city or upon a certain population or whatever else. So, and then, of course, that would get worldwide attention if they did that publicly. And so it wouldn't have to be a worldwide play or worldwide uh, drought or whatever. It could be uh, localized. But whatever they wanted to do. Now, that's what the Pope claimed back in the Middle Ages. And what it was is um, if, the, if a country didn't go along with them, if a king didn't go along with them, then he would pronounce an interdict upon the king in the country. And an interdict was that we will not have the mass or any of the sacraments in your nation until you get right with me. Now, what would that do? If, uh, if he did that to Mexico and the old, uh, what's the, the Mexican, uh, and the Mexican president said, well, I'm not going to do what, then all the people are going to say, wait, we're going to go to hell. Do you think that would cause the people to want to rise up against their, their ruler? Yes, well, that's what would happen in the Middle Ages, especially. And uh, so can you imagine the power that I had if I was able to go down and tell the mayor of this city, what he's going to do, and if he doesn't do it, then everybody here is going to go to hell and they're going to know it. Uh, you think he, the mayor might say, mm, I might think about that? I mean, that's political power. And so, But here we see that God gives these people the opportunity to do this and to bring judgment upon whom they please, or of course the Lord speaking to them through what they were going to do. And so we see that... Um, and if anyone wants to harm them, they must be, they must be killed in mat the, this manner. Um, and they have power uh, to shut heaven, and uh, no rain falls on the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Oh, boy. And they can pollute the, the rivers and to strike the earth with all the plagues and often as they desire. So, again, probably more localized here because we already see God doing it on a worldwide way. So there's going to be all kinds of things going on. Um, you know, sometimes when you, I, I, the last time I think of um, something that would really affect large parts of the world was Mount St. Helens. I'm sure there's been others, but that's the one I'm thinking, thinking of. But uh, when Mount St. Helens blew up out in Washington or whatever, uh, I mean, long, I mean it, it just, it got, airplanes couldn't fly because the ash in New York was too thick and they had to shut down airports all the way across the country and all the way into into Europe it was affecting. So one volcano can cause all kinds of problems. So you can see how localized something something so localized can can change the atmosphere of the whole earth. Well this again we see you as uh, the things that these uh, these men were given opportunity to do and so uh, even with all the rest of the stuff going on there were still signs and wonders do it, being done by these you know when Chernobyl uh, was uh, of course that was the last uh, that was that, that could have been a major worldwide ca catastrophe not because the nuclear power plant in Russia or Ukraine was going to blow up but because that thing was burning so hot that it was melting down into the bedrock, and they were very concerned about it melting down and getting into the water supply that supplied most of Eastern Europe into Poland and all the way to Germany and to Czechoslovakia and all the, the Hungary and all those countries, the, the whole, and then of course Russia. I mean, that water, that underground water supply, which we saw it was affected by one of those meteors that's gonna hit the earth and affected a fifth of the water supply or whatever. So here we see that, uh, uh, these men are giving power for localized. I mean, now you got God doing it on a worldwide, but these men have a look where they can actually sp talk to specific tongues, nations, 
And what are they doing? They're preaching individually to each one of these countries, to each one of these peoples. And so God is doing something worldwide and getting people's attention, and he's even the angels in heaven are proclaiming. But he's got two men now that are, and then of course 144,000 that are reaching people personally. Actually, these men are reaching them more nationally, and the 144,000 are going to be reaching them personally. But I think you get what I'm under, what you're what I'm saying. So you have God working on all strata, on all levels of His creation. You've got a one-on-one, -on -one, and you got national. You got uh, you got worldwide, and then you got heavenly. All these things that, that God is now changing the scope of his work. And then, then again, God is about ready to change the ages. And so uh, you say, well, do you really believe this is going to happen? God can do whatever he wants to do. I mean, well, how can God do that? Well, God created the heavens and earth in six days. Well, he couldn't have done that. He's no big, big enough. Well, my God's big enough to do everything. He's big enough to, I don't even understand. Uh, you know, they got, uh, it's taken us, centuries just to get to Mars and now we find out there's not much there um, and yet did God create Mars yes and what about then we find out from this new hub uh, this new telescope there's um, there's things that there's huge constellations out there that we didn't even know existed well well is that God doing all that yeah uh, how big is your God I don't know and you say, I don't know. You know, he's so big, I don't know. <laughs> I can't, I can't be, you know, he's so big, it just, it blows my mind. If he was, if I could understand how big he was, then, that, then, my, then he'd be pretty small because my mind cannot comprehend it. We sing that song. There's a, and man realizes that. And again, talking to people that really are facing death, they start realizing there's something bigger than life or bigger than my life out there. And I tell you, you know, you're going to live somewhere forever. And so, uh, again, even God has placed in the heart of man the understanding that there's something a lot bigger than they are that's out there. Even the most devout atheist has to come to that conclusion sooner or later. And so uh, our God is ready to change the heavens and the earth. And so we see now that uh, he says in verse 7 um, that, uh, oh, by the way, who, who are these witnesses? Uh, there were two men that we know of in the Old Testament actually that uh, didn't die. Can you remember who they are? Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. He was not for God took him. And then who was the other? Elisha. And of course, he was taken up in heaven. Okay. Who else? Elijah. Did I say a shah? Okay. Don't shush me. No, I'm not, as, uh, as Barry Webb would say. But, uh, uh, but uh, Elijah. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, many people, because it's a pointed man who wants to die. Well, these men didn't die. And so uh, we wonder. And then other people think it's Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets. So, you know, um, when we get to heaven, give me 50 years, and I'll let you know. At my age, uh, uh, that's a pretty good estimate. But uh, there again, uh, so these men are preaching uh, the word, and they were both preachers of righteousness. We know that, uh, that Elisha definitely was, or Elijah definitely was, and also that Enoch was. He preached the word. Now, uh, the olive trees and the lampstands actually come from uh, Zechariah 4.3, and it indicates that they are anointed and they are light bearers. Now, again, the olive tree was a picture of Israel. And um, the light bearers, which was the light of the world, we've mentioned that. Uh, their termination brings rejoicing like a reverse Christmas. Now, we saw, we see that uh, they, uh, they were able to, um, to a witness until the man of sin gains his power and consolidates it. And... They furnish a testimony in verse 7, and the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit, which we saw in chapter 10. Excuse me. 
Boy, I wish we had. Uh, we're going to have to get that, but uh, where we get editing powers on over our internet so they don't see little burps and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> hiccups and all that. But um, he says, and when the, they finish the um, testimony, the beast that descends out of the bottomless pit and will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie on uh, in the street, uh, street of the great city. And we know what it's called because it's uh, called Sodom in Egypt. Sodom, of course, whenever you think of Sodom, you think of of horribleness or sin. And of Egypt, of course, was every time you went down into Egypt, uh, they were, uh, except for the Lord Jesus, it was always going down away from God. Um, and so we see that, um, that their bodies were um, in Egypt, were also, uh, where also the Lord was crucified, which tells us it was Jerusalem. Uh, then those from the peoples, tribes, uh, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half years and not allow their bodies to be put into the, three and a half days and they shall not allow their bodies to be put into graves. So, hey, leave them out there. We want people to see that these people who terrified us so much are dead. Oh, isn't that great? Does that remind you of anybody? Paul says that Satan thought he had won the battle for three, three days. But then all of a sudden something happened. And the Bible tells us that if Satan had known that Jesus has, would have been risen from the tomb, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So all the battles about uh, were the Jews who crucified, the, yeah, they crucified the Lord, but so did we. And so who actually thought he crucified the devil of the Lord was, of course, Satan. But, uh, of course, the Lord won the battle. Um, and so we see it in verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice. Uh, boy, we got rid of those guys, those, those preachers. Man, they, they're giving us all kinds of problems. And so uh, and they shall make merry and they will either, they will use Amazon or somebody to send gifts to each other. And you say, well, wait, wait a minute, that takes a long time to get the mail. And if you have all these problems with, uh, with what's going on with earthquakes and everything else, then uh, the mail trucks might not be able to run. Well, I don't know how God's going to do it. Maybe it's going to be 3D or whatever. But uh, these people are going to be exchanging accolades with one another about these, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead. Well, you know, these men, they're going to be rejoicing. And uh, boy, isn't this good. We can go back to our drinking. We can go back to our good old carousing and these guys aren't going to bother us. And so they're going to be uh, sending gifts to one another because the two prophets who tormented them, uh, those that dwell on the earth. Now, I hate that, but, you know, I, as a man of God, of the cloth and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's interesting how that I mentioned to Evelyn uh, earlier, because I'm a pastor, I sent her by and she got it. You know, I, the door was open and all that, which is fine uh, because, and of course I knew she wasn't going in and she was going to be safe and everything. But uh, I told her and this, uh, that if I'd gone by there, they would not have answered the door. Now, there again, I'm not saying these are bad people. I'm just saying that a lot of times that's the way it is because the pastor is, you know, when, oh, uh, I mean, I saw somebody that you know, and they were in uh, the library, and they didn't think they were dressed right. I, I, I'm dumb me. I mean, unless you're wearing a bikini or something, it doesn't, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't worry about your hair or whatever else, you know. But, uh, you know, I didn't even, you know, I just was having a good day. And I, I was embarrassing her not just by my presence, you know. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But uh, to just, I, mean, I just don't, I mean, just don't notice those things as a guy. Now, there again, if you're wearing a pretty dress or something like that, I'll mention, hey, I really like that dress or whatever. But I won't do it if it's immodest or <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. So, uh, but here, uh, these guys, they were recognized. And these guys are tormenting us. And that's unfortunate. Sometimes I'll walk into a situation and I'm realizing I'm tormenting these people just because they know I'm a preacher. And they quit talking and they look at me or whatever. You know, that's, that's weird. Uh, 
And so uh, that's what happens, uh, you know, as a, as a Christian. You've had that happen, some of you, because I know you have good testimonies. And simply because you walk into some place, I think the atmosphere changes. And that's good. That's good, and, and yet at the same time, it's, it's a real burden to carry at times. But at least people know where you stand, and that's a, that's a real blessing. And so the, the, this uh, brings rejoicing, and uh, then also their resurrection, and, those, they, they are, and they ascend into heaven. And now, remember, everybody's watching this, and they got it on camera. Uh, as far back as the 60s. Now, they weren't able to show it uh, all over the world immediately, but uh, uh, I remember, and I think there's at least one other lady in here, maybe several others, but remember Lee Harvey Oswald and the man who shot him, Jack Ruby. Was it Jack Ruby? Yeah, I think it was Jack. Anyway, Ruby uh, killed him. I mean, that was all over television for the next six months. And uh, my dad saw it. We didn't go to church, so it was, I think it was on a Sunday morning, wasn't it? Uh, it was on, and uh, he saw it was live television. Whenever they were bringing uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had killed John Kennedy, the president, and uh, they right there on that live television, you know, he pulled out a gun and shot him. Uh, I mean, I saw that at least 25 to 30 times in the next, and probably more, in the next two years. And I was an eighth grader, seventh, eighth grader, whenever Kennedy was shot. And of course, it was played all over the world. Well, can you imagine that happening instantly and people in Australia seeing it instantly or Russia or wherever else? And so that's how far we've come in our, in our... Now, of course, when Lincoln was killed, it took weeks and months for anybody even to see pictures of it. But now they could actually see it. So if they see him being killed... Can you imagine what's going to happen when they look at that old television? And uh, if they miss it, there's going to be a replay. And they're going to see those guys raised from the dead. I mean, that is going to, I mean, there again, isn't it interesting how technology catches up with the Bible? It's not the other way around. You know, oh, that's old fashioned. No, you don't know what you're talking about, fella. The Bible is so far ahead of you. And here we see that uh, uh, again, I were, uh, again, if you go back to those days, I would think about that word 666 and how, and I saw how they were going to take uh, ink blotters. Remember the, the little stamps? You'd take the stamp and you'd stamp uh, uh, papers with or whatever. And I say, how can they put 666 on everybody's head all over the world? And how is it going to stay and all that? And that was weird. I mean, how, just the logistics of it said it was impossible. And it was. But now... We're going to digital society, and they already got your, they got your um, we used to say name, rank, and civil, uh, uh, and uh, name, a serial number, not, but the civil number, so a serial number, but they got, they got all your medical records and everything right there, and they got it all over the place. And so uh, just by you having who you are, I mean, they could do it with a certain little number and of course uh, they and they could trace everything about you from the credit card you use but are those credit cards they're getting they're getting dangerous to carry and so we need to have not only facial recognition but also genetic recognition so let's put it into your skin and so that we instantly know it whether that that number is correct or not because we not only have the number but we have not the chip but now skin sample to verify who you are well that's where we are and all we have to do if we don't want you to sell anything is touch a little number after it 666 and if you don't go along with us I mean, the bank, uh, uh, I'm cutting out uh, a bank card that we used, that I bought got for Judy. I had that just separate for her and only gave her $25. No, I gave her, <laughs> but uh, no, that was her card. But then I started reading about this company that uh, uh, there was a guy that went down to Florida and his wife couldn't use it because he put something on the internet that uh, was politically, the company didn't like. So she was down in Florida, she couldn't use her credit card. Well, I don't want that to happen to my wife, so I'm canceling that card. 
But the, you can imagine if I, all he had to do is say, we're going to put 666 after your number, after your name, and you won't be able to buy or sell. And our president, we're, I mean, you're hearing that we're going to a digital economy now. They're going to be taking away money from us. And so it's getting to the point where they're going to know every, if you buy a piece of bubble gum, they're going to know. And so it's interesting how that all that's coming, uh, coming to, to pass. Technology is catching up with the Bible. And so we see that uh, this is what's happening here is technology catches up with the Bible or is catching up with the Bible. And we know that we have the technology now, at least as far as I know, for most of this to happen within the next few months. But for these men to be seen all over the world, and here they are, oh boy, praise the Lord, those guys are de dead. <laughs> and they rise right in front of them. Uh, that's going to be amazing. And then we see that he talks so very quickly, we better uh, go on. He says, now after the three and a half days, the breath of the life of God entered into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who saw him. You can imagine that. And they heard a loud voice from heaven. There again, God is speaking and shaking the earth with his voice saying, come up here. And they ascended in the cloud and their enemies saw them and probably heard the Lord. And that same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. Do you think God's trying to get their attention? So God is witnessing. Yes, there's judgment, but even in judgment, he's giving the invitation for mercy. And so he's saying, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. And so God is uh, even witnessing during this time. And they, they ascended to heaven. The same hour the earthquake came. Uh, the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. And the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. It doesn't mean they were saved. They were just saying, there must be a God in heaven. Um, after hurricanes, I remember people, oh, preacher, it's different for me now. I'm going to start coming to church. And it lasts about three weeks, you know. But uh, in verse 14, the second woe was passed. And remember, there are three woes. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Um, and then now what we see here is what we saw with the, uh, the first judgments. And that was the seventh was an opening for the next. So here we have the seventh trumpet judgment. And we see that it's the opening. And then there's going to be a pause. But uh, we see, uh, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he shall reign forever. And the 24 elders, remember how that now John is transported back in heaven and he's seeing a vision there. And the 24 elders who sat before the Lord on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to the Lord. And they, there's a worship service in heaven. Um, and so uh, in verse 19 then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. That's why some people who are quite literalist don't believe you're going to find that temple of the lost ark on earth. It's in heaven. Uh, okay. Is it is the presence of God which in heaven or is it the literal material things? that God can, you know, whatever. Uh, but if it's on earth, man wouldn't recognize it anyway is it because God's presence isn't there, I think. we. But he says, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquake, uh, another earthquake, sounds like, and a great hail. So isn't it interesting how God keeps... You're using a, literally a, ba a heavenly baseball bat to get people's attention. And even though he's judging severely, he's offering mercy. Isn't God good? And I think, folks, if God tarries and doesn't let this happen within, you know, if the rapture doesn't come, we as a nation cannot keep going the way we're going. Uh, we're, our families are destroyed. If there's no family, there's no civilization. And so we're, go we're at Sodom and Gomorrah or worse. And we're going to fall apart. Even a nation can't hold together without families. And Russia knows that and China knows that. They banned a lot of the stuff that's going on here in America. I mean, they won't let transgender stuff going on in Russia or China. I mean, they, they're not dumb. You know? So this stuff that's happening in America today, folks, it's going to, we're, we're self-destructing. 
And so, but even in our self-destruction, God offers mercy. Folks, the bad days are coming unless we turn to God. But even in those bad days, I want to be the person to say, come back to the Lord. He still offers mercy. Amen? That's our, our message. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I want the Lord to come because I don't want to see that happen in my lifetime. I want to be of the rapture generation. That one, the people that go to heaven and never see death. But if that doesn't happen, I'm afraid for my grandchildren. Because we, you just can't last more than a generation or so with what's going on in our country today. Especially with the, very, the predators that are killing our kids and warping them and destroying them. I don't want it to keep on going. God, have mercy and protect our kids. Destroy us, or whatever. I don't want to see, well, I'm opening up a whole philosophical can of worms here, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Okay, well, <clears throat> we've got to go, but uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be frightened by it, but we want to be challenged by it. May we realize, Lord, that uh, we're your children. You're going to deliver us from the wrath to come. But, oh, Lord, may we be the bright and shining light in a darkening world. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.